And uh, in 2014, him and I, uh, you know, were sitting uh, in, in my mom's living room. Uh, I had just gotten arrested on felony charges uh, for helping my father, who was diagnosed with a terminal form of dementia, and working to get him medical marijuana long before uh, we had an amendment passed. And it, it was definitely um, a life-changing experience to go through the criminal justice system like I did, uh, to you know, have to go to rehab and get my record expunged, and, and just getting the, the peek behind the scenes and really see uh, how the prison industrial complex works, you know, how it's set up for people to fail. And that's why Carlos and I felt the need that um, a normal chapter was vital and necessary uh, in the Central Florida region. And we started out in Central Florida normal. Uh, recently, we uh, a couple years back, we uh, undergone a rebrand with Sun Coast Normal, and we have members that stretch uh, from the Gulf Coast to the Space Coast, uh, from all the way up in Citrus County, all the way down to Sarasota. And so I'm, ha I'm happy that we have a very large presence here uh, on the west coast of Florida and throughout the I-4 corridor, especially with this being a, a swing district. I think it's important uh, to point out that cannabis is a nonpartisan issue. The voters get it, whether you're Republican or Democrat, Libertarian, Green Party, Independent, Constitutional Party, whatever, if you're socialist, you understand that the struggles for people to live a healthy life and the fact that this has been a plant that humanity has a history with for thousands of years, utilizing it for medicinal purposes. And that it's just been in the last hundred that the policies of this government here in the United States um, have pushed forward a, a policy of prohibition, which has been motivated um, historically by racial prejudice and, um, and by political stakeholders in order to attack their own political opponents. And, um, you know, there's tons that we can get into in the history and such and, and how it became illegal. But today, we're here to highlight <coughs> women in cannabis in this ever in enterprising field, this pioneering movement, which is happening as cannabis becomes legal in more and more states. Uh, what is the role that women play? And what, is, what roles can women play? What roles are women playing now? And we put together an amazing panel of women who are doing big things in the cannabis space. Uh, whether it's uh, from the advocacy point of view, as business owners, or, or even as, uh, as bureaucrats and, and regulators uh, to make sure that you have a safe access uh, to cannabis products. And so um, I'm going to start by just introducing uh, the panelists that we have with us today. Um, the founder of Cannamoms and uh, co-founder of Wise Florida, Mariah Barnhart. Uh, the uh, founder and uh, owner yeah. <laughs> Director of Cannabis for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Ms. Holly Bell. <laughs> and then uh, Stacy Carroll, who is the clinic. <laughs> and Marisol Gowan, who is the CEO of uh, Freedom Scripts. So, um, as we get started, uh, for those of you who are grabbing your breakfast, by all means, please grab your breakfast, uh, sit down. If you want more juices, coffee, uh, help yourself uh, going up. Um, and yeah, we are streaming live as well. So, uh, if you're uh, on SoCo's normal social media, you want to share it, by all means, go to our Facebook page, like us. Um, this is this panel is actually being streamed live right now. So, you know, best, hey, <laughs> it's on social media. But um, that being said, I just want to start out um, with a simple question. And we'll kind of go around to everyone on the panel, but we'll start with you, Mariah. What was your motivation for stepping into this space? I think there's an obvious story here, but I want to start off with uh, patience and privilege. So this is something that I don't get to talk about a lot, but based on Chris's story, we actually came up locally in the same circles. I committed many more felonies than Chris ever could have dreamed of, including for the same person that he was arrested for committing a felony over. But I never got arrested. In fact, sheriffs came on the news with me to say that they wouldn't arrest me while I was committing federal felonies on the news. And so I think it's important to note that wherever we come from in this, using your privilege to try to give that same privilege to everyone else is really important. So with that, I am in cannabis because my own daughter, Dahlia, was diagnosed with brain cancer at the age of two in 2013, um, co-founded Cannamoms the following year, 
and have since co-founded Wise Florida at wiseflorida.org, which is the first mom founded and run adult use and home grow initiative starting right here in Florida. Myra, what was your, your motivation for stepping into this space? Hello, yes. Um, so my motivation was really um, being able to bring down the barriers that was uh, put up from our past generations, right? There was just so much um, bad propaganda um, following cannabis and hemp, um, which a lot of people just started realizing what hemp is just within the like uh, last few years. Um, and so for me, it was really educating my family. Um, as soon as I was able to get through to my mom specifically, I realized, okay, we can do this, um, you know, to help our community. Um, she was the hardest nut to crack. So when we, when we, when we got that, got through to her, um, I realized, okay, let's, uh, let's make this a lifelong mission. Uh, this is what I want to dedicate myself to. And, and so, um, yes, I just want to help educate the community just like I helped educate my, my family. <laughs> Director Bell, how about you? What was your motivation for stepping into this space? So um, I come from an agriculture background, raised on a farm, and um, twofold. I have a daughter that has mild cerebral palsy. That's where I got exposed to cannabis. She was using it for her spouse. So was I'm a retired banker, and I got exposed to cannabis because my clients branded names to cannabis, and I had to learn how you bank it. So that brought me into the business side where I met the commissioner, and she called me and said, I want to start a hemp program. I want it to be thought of as an agriculture commodity down here. Will you come down and help me do this? So that's what got me down here to do this and into cannabis <coughs> in the big way that I am now. Well, we're glad to have you in the sunshine. Today. Well, space accidentally come from where I manage traditional medical practices that I work with decided that they want to be patients because their patients were coming to them doing so much better elsewhere. So the physicians that I work for didn't know anything about cannabis, educate myself, educate them, educate the staff, and then moved into direct patient care. Patients that are looking to use cannabis as an alternative um, so that's how I'm here. I am also a patient, so I educated myself um, along the way. So it's been it's been quite an adventure. I'm very thankful. Melissa, what was your motivation? Stepping into this space, father, we're dying with cancer in a ten year stretch. Um, and back then, cannabis was not even a topic um, in New York as well as here in Florida. And I had to commute back and forth because my grandparents lived in Florida and my father lived in New York. So cancer was the biggest thing where there's so many different things from doing the chemo and doing the radiation, and doing all that therapy, that they needed something to help with the pain, with the hunger, with the not being able to sleep. So back in 2001 is when I jumped into the medical space. I was like, I want to be in the holistic side of medicine. That's where my passion is. So I became VP of marketing and sales for a large pharmacy out in Palm Harbor. And I worked in the compounding side. So, which is the more holistic side of pharmaceutical, where it's topicals, because the opiate epidemic at the time was outrageous in the state of Florida. And we didn't have medical cannabis then. So I worked with patients hand in hand, helping them with trying to get better alternatives and better control of their health and their medication. And with that, when the state of Florida introduced 
cannabis and being able to do medical cannabis, I did very well. What you did is I started working with physicians. So I went from pharmaceutical to medical consultant. I went out to the physicians. I spoke to them about medical cannabis, how they feel about medical cannabis, and how I can help them by helping their patients with getting the relief using medical cannabis. So I've been able to get patients licensed for the last several years. Since the state opened up, I was working with patients, I think I believe um, somewhere in the realm of five or 600 patients that I've gotten approved in the state of Florida. Um, and I'm so excited because the state now has gone from taking six months, nine days, 60 days. I'm getting patients approved in 10 minutes. I am so excited about it. So we are now able to go out and help these patients with alternative options and not have to stick so much pharmaceuticals into their bodies. Let's balance it out. Let's give them what they need to treat the ailments that they have and try to do it as holistically as we can. So that's what brought me into the medical cannabis space. Thank you, Madam Sutton. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors of this grant, this uh, Verano Move. Uh, thank you to Move for you know, being able to provide the, you know, just as a sponsor, we were able to provide an amazing spread. Uh, thank you to uh, Season Corner for just an amazing spread that they put out today. And uh, again, if you want more juice, coffee, please help yourselves as you get up. Um, the next question I have, you know, cannabis has long been a counterculture staple. But what is the role that women have in making this mainstream? And I'm going to direct this first question to Mariah. Mariah, I should have read the question to Hi. I have a very conceited take on this and believe that women have done 90% of the work in making cannabis mainstream, but in reality, the men that we work with, I think, share that view in that, um, first, women aren't, you don't go into a subculture and suddenly women are revered, right? We're in a society that is run by men. This is the one place that I have seen men really relinquish the reins. Now, when the money comes into play, they come back into leadership positions and try to put you in token positions for sure. But in bringing it mainstream, the entire intent of Canna Moms was a psychological experiment of what this looked like when pastors' wives and PTA moms were running the new underground market, right? Um, and that was very successful. And so if we can continue to bring women to the forefront with their maternal instincts, whether they're mothers or not, um, Women have compassion. We have, you know, special traits about us that really haven't been being broadcast at the forefront of any industry in American history. So this would be the first one. If we can refuse to allow men to come in and take over the industry and the women that have passed the laws, created the compassion within the communities, done the education. I co-authored the first CME program for physicians in the state of Florida. That is not my place. Um, but as a mother, as a woman, um, that was something that I just felt obligated to do. And there are a lot of women like me who are taking on jobs that really aren't theirs for the betterment of all of society. So in my opinion, women have really been at the forefront of the legislative changes and the public perception shifts of the stigma and the stereotypes. Thank you, Mariah. You know, touching on that, mothers are vital in keeping their children safe. Uh, you know, mothers lead public education campaigns across the nation. Uh, Director Bill, this question is to you. What type of education do you think the American public needs when it comes to cannabis? Um, a lot. I mean, how do you reverse 70 years of a message? So it's going to take a lot. And even with a lot of education, uh, people are still, I can provide them facts, data. I just spoke to a financial crimes unit in Miami on Thursday morning. And it, it consisted of everything from secret service to narcotics officers to, you know, IRS, everything. And they have been fed data and half of them in the room are still convinced yeah. it's the devil. So, um, in, they were quoting statistics about use in Colorado with kids, and I, so I had to correct them because the data is out there to show that actually crime goes down, neighborhoods are safer, there is less alcohol consumption, there are less DUIs, there is increased revenue that goes to the schools. 
there's so much kind of good that, that can happen. So I do believe that every state should require education and fund it at the state level with these programs. Sadly, Florida is not doing that right now, but the Department of Agriculture is getting ready to roll out a consumer education series. Um, and we do town hall meetings and other things to help educate people. But the commissioner recently asked me to develop that and we have, and that will be starting here in the next couple of weeks because we want anybody to come learn and it'll be a webinar. So it is, there's a tremendous amount to reverse 70 years. That's fantastic to hear, uh, you know, uh, Florida Department of Agriculture taking you know, you know, we strive to educate folks on our chapter. I just spoke to the Kiwanis Club on Wednesday, and uh, there were folks in there. One guy, he asked me, he's like, well, what's next? We're going to have recreational cocaine laws? And I was like, well, it makes sense to decriminalize drugs. Portugal did it 10 years ago, and they have amazing uh, drops in, in, in addiction. Uh, crime rates go down. You know, their society is flourishing. It's not they're going to hell in a handbasket. Oregon recently did the same thing. Um, we have to stop thinking that we can over police our way, you know, out of this. So. Can I have one thing? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what you asked, Mo. So culturally, if you want to change a mindset, the women have to do it. And I apologize, men, but the mothers spend time with the children from birth on up. And it's from birth on up that they can educate those children and culturally change things. That's a known fact in any country around the world. If you want to change the dynamic, the women have to do it because they've got to educate the children. Well said. You know, what? I, my next question goes to Marisol. Are there any systemic barriers and have you encountered them personally in stepping into this cannabis space? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Can you share with us a little bit of what you've encountered? Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, let's look at, let's start at the top, where the licenses were issued. How many Black-owned farmers have a license? Zero. That's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. Because we can't go criminalizing things, throwing people in, in jail for things um, like marijuana, and then turn around and only give the licenses to the Caucasian world and not look at the mixed interracial side of things. Like, no, it should be an even field. It should be an even playing field, period. If you have the backing, you have the financial backing, you have the education, you have the pharma, why can you not be in line right next to someone else? Why would you get put aside just because of your background, your skin color, or your sex? Like, it's, it's not. I've seen it with females, and I've seen it with the African American community, the Hispanic community, and really, let's be fair. Let's be fair, let's make it even for everyone to have the, the ability and the, and the same accountability as everyone else. It, I don't think that one person should be picked over another just over their gender or their race. Um, so I've seen it a lot throughout the years and I am a constant advocate for patients. Um, I literally look at, majority of my patients were the 50 and over, it's actually now spread out and it's, a, it's now a younger generation um, but the younger generation has got issues that the older generation might not. The older generation, I see a lot of physical issues. I see a lot of the internal health issues. And with my younger generation patients, I'm seeing a lot more of the mental health issues, the stress, the anxiety. And, you know, COVID didn't help that situation at all across the board for everyone. Um, so I've been able to see patients literally within minutes be able to use an oral tincture and just calm down, like not feel so anxious. So we really need to market to everyone and give everyone the same opportunity to be in this space. Why can't we all be a part of this space? There should be no reason why we shouldn't. And to touch on women um, and being able to bring that medical cannabis out to society, let's be honest, 
The female plant is the euphoric plant. <laughs> well said. Need I say more? Well said. You know, um, I'm touching on, on just a little bit of background education. When we talk about systemic barriers, one of the things that was in the original implementation of Amendment 2 was you had to be a nurseryman licensed in Florida for 30 contiguous years. That in itself was a systemic barrier. Um, actually, because if you go back far enough in Florida's history, Jim Crow laws prevented black farmers from holding nursery licenses. So that is why currently uh, there is one black farmer license up for grabs in Florida because they realized, oh, we excluded an entire class of people uh, in this by the way they designed it. And so there, there is one. But here's something even funnier. The original licensing fee for the big five dispensaries was 60 k The black farmer license fee is 140 k They had to change it <laughs> since the beginning. They changed it just for the black farmer. Oh. Yes. So, so as we talk about systemic barriers, this is what the Florida legislature has done. Now, Director Bell is an appointed official by the Department of Agriculture, so understand that your votes matter because the politicians that put good regulators like her in place are the ones that write these laws. In many cases, just aren't doing it for us. And let's not forget they made the application more complicated yes too. And yes. can I can I answer that? Yeah. Um and without mentioning any names, I actually um specifically helped a black farmer that had over 30 years of agricultural experience that applied for the state and the state denied that. They were the only minority, majority minority owned company that had and met over exceeded every benchmark and was denied. So we really need to handle the systemic, systemic issues that we have in the state of Florida and yeah. licensing. This next question is for Stacy. Um, there's this pop culture meme, if you will, or, or notion that cannabis companies are run by frat boys who grew up to be Wall Street bankers and have no clue how to turn cannabis into a profitable business. What do you think needs to happen to change this perception in the space? And what role should women play in doing that? I think women are the natural educators, and I think changing perceptions, I know a lot of times, just in the clinic where, where I work and the patients that come in, they're very surprised when people like myself just start talking cannabis with them, start talking in detail, start talking in a language that they understand and they know. So I think that it just be being more accepted in general by everyone. And I think by changing it, the perception has been for so long that cannabis is a gateway drug. And, and I can tell you, it's not. It's an exit drug. It is absolutely an exit drug. I see it every single day, patients getting off of all kinds of medications and using cannabis to get them there. So, um, this next question is for you, Mara. Um, as a small business owner making way to space, where do you see yourself in the next five years? Yes, thank you. Um, so, yes, as a, as a small But everybody's so focused on the psychoactive effect that they, they almost forget about the fact that it's a, a holistic plant that has so many benefits and so many other cannabinoids, almost 120 or 40 uh, cannabinoids, that really help, um, help your body out. And so, and so as a small business owner, I thought, well, you know, this industry is, uh, is really thriving. Um, the, the hemp space is, uh, is, is almost like overlooked, um, and, and so yeah, I just see myself really, really growing and exponentially here in the state of Florida and moving out um, across the nation. So. I'm glad you touched on something on there. Um, you know, we're now seeing more and more 
uh, cannabinoids derived uh, from the hemp plant because of prohibition. Because you know you have to have a magic card. You, you have to be one of these vertically get uh, licensed and integrated MMTCs to actually supply medical marijuana. So a lot of creative business owners, a lot of creative scientists have figured out how to source Delta A, THCO, and other cannabinoids from the hemp plant. So my question to you, uh, uh, Director Bell, is are these um, hemp-derived cannabinoids safe for consumption? Should people have concerns about THCO or Delta 8 uh, from the hemp plant? So this is like the plant. All right, that's the hot topic, and I spend a lot of time on this. So <clears throat> first and foremost, I'm going to say this. Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the hemp team, has spent hundreds of hours studying this before the first Delta 8 ever hit the shelves, because we saw it coming. The Director of Food Safety, which regulates that portion with me, is a chemist with a PhD. He's run analytical labs for years. He gets it. He told me, and along with this, that we knew it was coming. So one of the very first things we did is I went to the black market, and I found someone, and I said, will you anonymously come talk to my group and tell you Tell us what's coming, how you're making it, what you see on the street. So we did. Um, we dove in from there. So the conclusion that we came to in the state of Florida, after all this study with attorneys, scientists, chemists, biologists, pharmacologists, regulators, um, was that if it naturally occurs in the plant, we will allow it to be sold in Florida. So when you go back to the statute and look at how they've defined synthesis, and you go look at that definition, it's not black and white. Problem number one when I get in a court of law. Problem number two when I get in a court of law is there is no scientific proof when you test that product to say they chemically made it. You may think there is, but we've been down this rabbit hole. There is not. So. I have a fiduciary obligation, I feel, as a state employee to spend your tax money wisely. So is it a wise use to go into a lawsuit knowing I'm going to lose? I don't feel like it is. So how can I regulate the safety for consumers without wasting my money on a lawsuit? So that's the approach we took. We go out and test as many products as we can. We have two labs that have whole cannabis methodologies, and believe me, we test them, we pull them off the shelf. What I found with Delta 8 is the reason that people are buying it is because it has a high residual of Delta 9 that never got converted. That's what's getting them high. It's not the Delta 8, guys. Not at all. So, um, and so what happens when I find those products, they busted the total THC limit of M. So I pull them off the shelf. We pull them constantly, constantly, constantly. We do regulate that market. The other thing I am going to tell you, and I love Move and Verano, and I meet with your CEO, and, and I toured your plan in Avala Beach about uh, three months ago. It was fascinating. The most fascinating tour I have ever had. And Walter, your COO, he comes from Russell Stover Candy. That man is, oh my gosh, he's brilliant. Um, so I get the concern from the MMTCs. I get the concern from law officers. I get everybody's concern. Um, and I do have concerns myself because even in the pharmaceutical world, they make drugs chemically and there are unintended consequences, right? And we don't know for years sometimes what those unintended consequences are. So be careful what you put in your body. Consumer, be aware. I personally do not consume Delta 8 products. So I have. I try them. I'm the guinea pig. I will go out and try things. <laughs> and I made my husband do it for the longest time. He finally said, are you, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> So I said, okay, I'll pony up, I'll, I'll do it with you. So, um, and I tried a Delta 10 product. Worst experience I've ever had. 
And um, so you really, as a consumer, have to first be in charge of your body and be careful. It was an edible. It was a gummy. And because of how it metabolized. Yes. So I, I don't think it would have mattered, though. I'm going to be honest. It was. And had I not had the knowledge I had, I would have understood why somebody would have sent themselves to the hospital. Um, I literally thought, oh, this is not pleasant, but I have another two hours of this, and it's going to peak in 15, and that's going to be really unpleasant. Um, and it was. So, did you have a question? What did she say? Okay. I said, I have a question on what you're saying. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm one of those 70, uh, great 70 years great wars. I think yeah. that is all right because I'm right. a So I'm just learning all of this. And my issue is about regulation. Um, the modern is going to be through something that I'm turning the chapter because I'm retired now. But when you talk about it's so funny because my question is regulation. Because as you talk about Mars, if you do believe that it's a gateway to something else, 20 years of brainwash that was clean. Um, the other part of that is, which no one really can explain to me, and I don't really think I understand what you're saying, was regulation. Because if you can't regulate it, then how do you monitor it, whereas it does not affect different people that want the same result? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm listening, I'm, I'm trying to take everything in. Right. So what is regulation? Right. You have to, under, and I didn't understand that until I took this job. So as a state employee, I'm given a statute by the state elected officials. Then our department has, and you can consider that statute a, an outline for a book. Then we have to write the chapter, so those are our rules. That's what regulates and dictates how a program is regulated in the state. So I'm only as good as the budget I'm given, just like a police force. You can only stop so much crime because you can't be everywhere at every moment, can you? Same thing with regulation. So I get out there, I scour as much as I can, but guess what? Our governor won't give me a budget. Our elected officials wouldn't give me a budget. So we have to take from other programs. It's just like food safety. People still get salmonella. We have inspectors out there. One would have thought that shouldn't be happening. It still happens. So does that kind of help? Yeah. Put a perspective on it? It's just like you being a police officer. Were you a police officer? Yeah. yeah. So it's just like that. Crimes still get committed? Yeah. Crimes still. You're, let me tell you. This is something that most people don't understand I do. But I work with narcotics officers every week. They have become some of the, my best network in the state. We do have nefarious activity in this hemp industry and other industries. They are my biggest asset in health, and I am theirs. And we collaborate every week. Um, and that's what we're here to do is support each other. So you have to look at it like crimes. A police. There's still crimes committed in a neighborhood, even though you got police patrolling. You can't, who said this? You can't regulate morality. We try, but you can't. As we walk in the hard way. My pinky swear sister, and I'm also a public officer with the state of Florida. <clears throat> um, I just want to say there are additional steps that have been taken. Nobody wants to hear this in today's world because everybody wants to go to the doctor and get a pill and a quick fix. It's our job to educate our society, and this is where women come in. I do sit on, uh, well, I sat on the Hemp Committee as a founding advisor. I sit on the Cannabis Committee now. Medical marijuana. Oh, okay. This, that, that's fine. Um, so, she actually worked with legislators every year to try to create law and scientists and doctors and consumers and industry owners. And they actually have introduced legislation. Uh, they've tried every route of, you know, the government tyranny and
and over policing does not work. The opioid epidemic was born under the war on drugs. The war on drugs is a war on black and brown people. All of these things are facts, absolute facts in writing, records not sealed. We know this. Um, and so the idea that we can overregulate these things and regulate morality, it doesn't work. But this is why it's so important that people who are passionate about helping their fellow man, their neighbors, the kids in their community, that we go out and educate because people aren't always. Look at Spice. Where did Spice come from? I'm in a group, we work with Mothers United Against the War on Drugs who literally have had their children die in front of them from overdoses. There is no greater trauma in all of life than knowing that these things were avoidable. But because of the society we live in, under the war on drugs, these horrific laws, um, and the lack of true education that these kids are getting, my son knows a pill will kill him and the cannabis plant will not. I'm not going to lie to someone and then watch them die of a fentanyl overdose. It's not going to happen. Um, so it is our job. Nobody wants to hear that because we want the government to do it. We want the police to do it. We want Holly to do it. We want someone to take responsibility. We're so used to quick fixes. This is our job. If we're going to change future generations and the health of our own nation, it is each of our jobs. That's it, right? So you're right, we have to be responsible citizens. We have to take accountability. Um, you know, that's consumers as it's directed opening. You got to pay attention when you put in your body. I mean, we have some great vendors out here today, you know, who are licensed, you know, uh, um, hemp distributors and such. And, and we asked them to be a part of this. Like, hey, we actually know that the director of cannabis is coming. You could have had a license together. You could have everything. All your paperwork there. And some of us actually are not here today because they paid for paperwork. <laughs> so, and, and, but there's some great people out there. Um, but that's the thing is that you've got to educate yourself. So because not everybody is as great as the people we have here today and the vendors we have here today. Not everybody's going to run their business in, in, in that type of way. Not everybody's going to source from reputable places that test their products. So you as a consumer do have to do your due diligence. If you're buying your stuff at a cut rate gas station in the middle of nowhere, maybe, you know. But, but you know, if you go to a reputable place like Chill, like Carlos has, or some of these other vendors out here that we have, yeah, there's some great opportunities for you that you, you can um, you know, get the relief that you need. Sorry. Yeah, and, and I'd like to say something about that, that too. Um, <laughs> Tell yes, about yes, your yes because uh, I actually do sell in gas stations, and there are a lot of gas stations that have really good quality products. However, there's also a lot of products that don't stand up to that standard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I think Coca Cola holds its integrity, whether it's in a gas station, at a bar, in a hospital, right? So if you won't lose integrity in the product as long as you have integrity in your in your in your materials that you're using, um, in your you know brand and um, and so yeah, I just I don't think that it has anything to do with the gas stations. I think what it has to do is making sure that the the products that are coming in maybe from China, you know what I mean, like the oils, you know, we don't know what's in them, things like that. Pull those off the shelves. You know, those aren't good for us anyway. Popcorn line is really dangerous, but definitely keep keep quality products out on the market because at the end of the day, gas stations were the only businesses open 
clean, clean medicine, because that's what it is, right? Um, the Department of Agriculture sees it as a vitamin, even. Um, so, so, yeah, it's very interesting that we've been deprived of that vitamin that keeps us healthy, right? So we got about 20 minutes left of this panel, and I'm going to take some questions from the audience here. So I'm going to ask some, some to, to you ladies. Um, this one is actually for you, Mariah. How do you fight the negative stigma that is assigned to cannabis plants? Um, so I think it's
conversation with everyone else. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, this next question for Yamara. Yamara, what's your, your best advice uh, would be for someone who wants to uh, get into or, or think about starting a uh, business in this space? Never give up. <laughs> um, every day I, I tell myself I'm a drop of water and constantly just trying, trying until you break through, right? Water makes its way through. Um, the Grand Canyon was made that way, persistence. Um, so if you really want to get into this space, um, I would say pick, pick a lane, stick to it, um, whether it's education, whether it's volunteering in your community, um, you know, whether it's just being an advocate and a sponsor um, for the planet. Um, I would say, yeah, just um, get, get involved um, through Psychos Normal as well. Um, we do a lot in the community and um, it's just a creative organization. So, um, yeah, just uh, get, a, get a pamphlet. We'll get you involved if you want to get into the space, whether it's owning your own business. Um, Ms. Holly Bell, what is it, cannabis looking like for um, for us in the future, like recreational, things like that? Do you think licenses will be available for people like me? Uh, I don't That's a great question. The Florida Supreme Court upheld vertical integration. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what will happen, right? I don't personally see how they can keep that when we go to an adult use program. I do believe that it will be, there's going to have to be some kind of hybrid where we recognize the ones that have done it and there's a way where we can integrate a small business into it. And I, I think there's some conversations trying to happen about that. Yeah, this is, this is very important to me because when, um, you know, when I started in um, the hemp industry, I was supposed to be an insurance agent for State Farm, <laughs> um, but, but but then I realized, okay, you know, uh, what's my 50 years looking like in the future? And um, and so I just applied the same business model to him, and it's worked out. It, um, that's all you need to do. I'm a retired banker. Stick to your focus, like she said. Find a niche. People who find niches in any industry are extremely successful. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, this question for you, Director, what is a certificate of analysis and where would someone go to find that info? So, does um, anybody bring a cannabis product with them? Um, <laughs> or your cannabis product? <laughs> <laughs> That's my Yeah. 
here, it's manufactured here, and now that product must have passed all the high standards that Florida has. And we are a gold standard in the United States. So whether you're walking into a move or her store, if you see fresh from Florida, you can be assured that this has been grown in your state and is following under the standards that we put forth. Does that help? So this next question I got here um, is, which government positions are most critical in pushing marijuana in the right direction of Florida? So I'm going to answer that for y'all. Okay. It's your state representative and your state senator. And for those of you who don't realize or who those people are, they're not the ones in Congress, they're not the ones going to D.C., the ones who represent you in Tallahassee. And our state representatives and state senators this past session, um, you know, let's just call it like it is. Florida is a state that the majority of the state legislature is run by the Republican Party. Now, for you Republicans in the room, the best thing you can do is probably elect new leaders. Because we, as a chapter, um, Gary Steinbeck, Gary Ward for Public Policy, uh, helped me co-author several pieces of legislation. Key pieces like employment protections that would prevent medical marijuana patients from losing their job or being precluded from a job. Or patient protections that would prevent uh, sick people from being kicked out of the nursing home or being kicked off a pain management plan because they chose to go to medical marijuana. These were things that were shouted down without even a vote. They took a voice vote on the House floor at 1030 at night and all the Republicans just went no to every amendment. Didn't take a roll call vote, didn't vote on it for the record so you can, you can know about it. So if you want to know what positions are the uh, most important, it is that because it is also them who will implement those constitutional amendments we the voters pass. And we the voters clearly pass an amendment that if seen, you should have full access to the plan. Mr. Joe Renner has to go all the way up to the Supreme Court of Florida. Thankfully, he's a rich guy that can do this here on the network. They would to take that all the way to the Supreme Court. You know, so that being said, the most important thing you can do this coming election is go back and see how your representatives have been voting. Go back and see how your senators have been voting. And if they haven't been voting the way you want them on campus, it's time to vote their ass out. Yeah, uh, I will go to your honor and then uh, the director Bill. Um, also, really quick, Ms. O, um, you said that you are creating a educational program right now. Um, I think that's great. And I want to add to that. Maybe there's a way that we can also just like food safety classes, um, uh, have something similar like for hemp in gas stations. So a program maybe that gas station owners should go through and like the warehouses and things like that so that they can be educated because they're actually in the front line too. Um, and it's, I, I just think it's, um, it's, it's important for the community right, to do that. Right. Yeah, I think you want to talk about politics too. Right? I just want to say one thing about politics. If you don't get involved, nothing's ever going to change. Do you know that on the first bill where we got him, they forgot to put an age limit on ingestible? So literally, I can, because of how regulations work, a 
people can do something based on the need of the consumer, a poor voter, not playing politics, but genuinely the best thing for our children and our society. And if people don't start paying attention and voting based on the well-being of the constituents of these elected officials who believe their leaders and not service, nothing is going to get better.